We've spoken to you on the show before. You've you've looked into this. I would say something something of a, a, a UK wide expert on cladding. Now, yeah. uh, something I think you probably never thought would happen in your career. Um, it is extraordinary, I think, to most people, the idea that we can have this public inquiry, a huge expense, huge amount of time uh, to, to go into what happened in this horrific tragedy. And we found out only on Monday just how bad some of those building works were, those refurbishments were, and their contribution uh, to those 72 deaths in June last year. And yet it, it's extraordinary to me that a load of these contractors and subcontractors are able to just say nothing and not contribute at all. And nothing seems to be happening to them. Well, good morning, Julia. Thank you. Yes, um, it's it, it is a uh, it's a situation where, of course, everybody is is passing the, the book uh, still, and in a way that's expected. I'm sure it's, it's what their legal counsel ha- have advised. I have to say, I did find one thing that was interesting from what one of the companies said yesterday. Uh, the company that manufactured the panels, um, Arconic, a big U.S. company. Um, and it said that basically the the rules weren't followed with respect to our, to to the the the, the, the padding panel. They're, but they're yeah. saying basically, if it had been done right, then it would have been safe. Well, well, one of the things they're saying is no, that their panels effectively shouldn't have been used. Oh. They, they say the law says there are two two routes to which a cladding system can be be uh, compliant with the law. Arconic said yesterday neither route was followed. It said furthermore that there are two other routes that sometimes are used in the industry. They're not they're, there's no basis of those. They're not mentioned in the regulations. They're used, but they said even those two, which are sort of unofficial, they weren't used. So Arconic has said really there's just no evidence that they can see, and they can see lots of evidence to suggest you know there's no evidence that, that the rules are followed, and they can see uh, evidence to suggest they definitely weren't followed. So in a way, um, you saw sort of Arconic throwing some of the other people involved in this under a bus yesterday. So yes, uh, everybody denied responsibility, but we did, interestingly, start to get a degree of, 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 of finger pointing uh, from within that group of companies who in some way are connected to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to the, the terrible disaster. I mean, in a way, that's of our best hope is that this, their finger pointing will we'll get to it. Although I do wonder, Peter Herbert, whether we're going to get to a situation where, uh, especially after what we heard on Monday, so many different people, companies, organisations, decision makers were to blame that it almost spreads the blame so widely. People can say, well, you know, there's no individual responsible. Is it important to you and to, to the people you re- you represent that that there is that, that someone, some entity, some company, some person is personally held to account and is perhaps charged with a crime? Well, it's, it's not so, so much uh, for um, myself but it, and the it is the strategic view that we've taken that whether it's one or several persons or companies responsible, they must be brought to justice. And therefore, whilst you know, in terms of a, an ordinary accident, it may well be there's one driver involved. Here, there were many, but that doesn't lessen their individual culpability because it, it is a combination of factors, appalling neglect, mismanagement, underfunding, and people simply not doing their job properly um, that brought this tragedy about. It was wholly av- av- avoidable. And therefore, you know, seeing people being lawyered up, having uh, exercising their right to silence, um, is all very well for them and protecting their self-interest, but it's nothing for the bereaved families or for really very much for the search for the truth either. Well, no, indeed. Uh, and I can understand, yes, that people have a right legally not to incriminate themselves. Uh, and yet, you know, if, if we're not going to get answers, and it seems to me that there should be something that requires people to give information in this certain scenario. And the lawyer, um, Danny Friedman, representing some of the survivors, uh, said effectively Kensington Council had instigated and overseen a refurbishment of the tower block in such a way, he said, as to render it a death trap. Is that how uh, survivors feel? Well, in a sense, survivors feel many, many different things. But I, I think there is a common thread that, yes, that this was an accident waiting to happen. And that, in a sense, that the, 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 any one of those factors would have been critical. The cladding alone. I mean, in the United States, I understand in Germany, you simply are not allowed to use such cladding uh, above a certain floor level or at all, irrespective of its quality or propensity. And that coupled with the fact that there was only one fire escape, there's no emergency lighting, there wasn't any sprinkler system, the fire doors were ineffective. I mean, the list goes on. But it, it is, in a sense, any one of those, if they had been happened in a privately rented or owned block, would simply not have been tolerated. Um, you know, and, and I think that the, 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 uh, 
the, one of the dire things here that is coming to light is the way that people address social housing in the United Kingdom. This is not unique. It clearly was present in many other buildings, and until remedial action is taken, lives will still continue to be at some risk. Indeed, Peter Herbert, thank you. Tom Bergen, just a final word to you. I mean, this is it, isn't it? Uh, this, this isn't a one-off. This isn't a, a unique situation where uniquely useless contractors uniquely put in uh, the wrong product uh, in the wrong way and cause these deaths. Uh, th- th- there's, there's no reason not to think that there are hundreds of tower blocks in this country with exactly the same problems uh, and which, which equally could also be death traps. Absolutely, Julia. The government has identified 300 uh, buildings which have non-compliant uh, uh, cladding. And what's interesting is, is, as well, as that we discussed before, you know, I, I identified 65, and that's out of 80 that I managed to identify. So the vast majority of the samples that I looked at were actually not compliant when the work was done on them. Yeah. So, and, and the amazing thing is, not only are the councils involved not going after these companies to seek recompense, but strangely, these companies are actually being rehired to, <laughs> to make good the work, the botched work that they did in the first place. So that's the, extraordinary. The, it, it's, it, you know, to say that you know there's any sort of there's really it's difficult to see that evidence of, of holding anybody to account when you can actually uh, you know put in place dangerous flammable cladding, and when the law says that shouldn't happen, and then you get rehired to uh, to, to do it. They're it actually really they're actually making more money out of it. In many respects, you might say it was it was a good business decision. Clearly, it wasn't done consciously, but it was certainly something that ended up with generating more profit for companies because they have been rehired to to do the same job twice. Do you know what? I, I really thought by this stage, almost a year on from the Grenfell fire, I couldn't still be shocked by revelations. But I, yep, that has shocked me.